innovation. That's Twini Ngawai from Ngāti Parau, who as I understand it, wasn't able to speak on a particular occasion and so she wrote a song. And she wrote her speech and she mihied her speech as her waiata. Now if the whakapapa of that waiata is not 100% correct, and I'm conscious that Arohi is sitting in the room, then the story is a very good one. <laughs> because it is about our taking, as we've heard in the last day and a half, our own position in our own world, our own real, our own mātauranga, and our own rights back each and every day in what we do. So my moko gets sung to before he gets spoken to. And when he sees me now, and he doesn't see me often enough because I've had to shift out of the house, it appears I'm a stalking grandmother. <laughs> The first thing he does when he sees me is he goes like this, because he's ready to sing. So yes, I am the founder of Hope Brokers, because in our world, hope is not just aspirational, it's not just ontological, because those things apparently are not the apex of knowledge, it's actually epistemological. Our hope is in our mountains, our hope is in our awa, our hope is in our whenua, and our hope is in our intergenerational, long-term view of our rangatiratanga. So yes, I founded Hope Brokers because that's who I was brought up by. My grandparents were Hope Brokers. My parents were Hope Brokers. And actually, I think if we didn't have hope in our family, we came pretty close to getting a hiding because we were not allowed to sulk. We were not allowed to sulk. Our grandparents worked in the church, our parents worked in education, and we were brought up with a very clear view that we were responsible to get on and do stuff. We had been given gifts by our tipuna, and it was our responsibility, not our opportunity, it was our responsibility to get on and create change. I can tell you now that as a woman who is approaching retirement, lying on the couch on a Sunday afternoon watching a movie is heaven because we were never allowed to do it as kids. <laughs> it just was not going to happen. I also I want to acknowledge um, Whatarangi Winniata in the room. When I was a junior lecturer at Massey in 1981, I met Whata. He was one of the first iwi leaders I met at Massey in my new capacity. And he was intrigued that Massey had a junior lecturer in Māori education. I could tell from the look on his face. <laughs> and he said to me, so I have three questions for you. I said, yes. He said, what is maramatanga? How do you know when you get there? And how do you get there? I'm happy to tell you that after 40 years of self-directed whānau-based learning, I can answer those questions. <laughs> it's taken a long time. Um, and Dame Tariana, my sister was a PA at Ratnapā. And um, so I actually met and heard all about um, Tariana and her whānau and her work when I was quite young. Actually, I think we were at the Wangaihu Hotel at one point and I wasn't supposed to be there. So <laughs> I, I was a little demure about when I actually met you. Uh, but my sister was very clear um, about your role in the community and, and the way in which leadership has grown from the bottom up. Of course, what I'm doing in, in telling this story is outlining key characteristics of Mataranga Māori, inside out, from the bottom up, whānau based, marae based, hapu based, and about being able to live our lives as we were determined 
we want to live them. And that's what the last one and a half days has been about. So yes, Hope Brokers is about creating new futures with people and organisations. After many years of working in white stream uh, universities, teaching our people, working in Māori education courses and engaging in Māori scholarship, which didn't give me sufficient skills to work out how to use this. <laughs> yeah, oh, the big green one, <laughs> staring me in the face. And part of that journey in working through education and bringing together uh, my own skills a a as a uh, young Māori woman who trained as a primary school teacher, went into academia with a professional background and was, you know, met with raised eyes because I didn't have an academic background, I had a professional background, um, became an academic and worked in the space of creating Māori education courses to help make a difference to our people. Uh, to be met with such racism in the university system that I actually can't share the stories much because you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't believe me. And, and one of the interesting things that has happened, because I did start in 1981, which is a little while ago, is that I've subsequently had people, some of whom worked in the same departments, who would ring me and say, you know what, sister? I thought you, I thought you were bullshitting. You weren't. <laughs> and those very things are still happening to me. So I'm quite happy now to be the CEO of a small consultancy. Um, using academic skills and research to advance kaupapa Māori and Māori development. One of the key messages I was given, uh, whilst at Massey in the education department, was that I didn't need to worry about doing a doctorate because the kind of work that I was likely to do wasn't going to need one. How's that for a motivating force? So the key thing about unpacking what works with Māori is to answer the question for yourself about rangatiratanga, about Māori development, and to be able to explore that question, which is a very broad question, in what works with Māori people, what works with Māori knowledge, what works with Māori organisations, and what works with Māori policy. And this is a, a rich policy forum, as well as a whānau development forum. So exploring those questions from a range of different lenses is really important. <laughs> Answering the questions in any context about what works with Māori requires an approach that has a structural analysis dimension, that has an infrastructural analysis dimension, and that is about citizenship. This is a nation building lens we are talking about. And to take any other approach is to leave one in a space of exploring a kind of victimhood that you don't have the structural historical context for and which leaves you bereft of the real understanding of what our people have experienced and what our people have been through. And so this is a framework that is an upgrade of one of the frameworks used in What Works with Māori, the 2013 Families Commission report. It is a treaty-based nation-building framework which asks us to use the treaty as a way of understanding how we can move into the future as a nation. It, it's an interface between Mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge, and also between an emerging body of theoretical work coming through in the 1970s and early 1980s called critical theory. Why is critical theory important and why does it have such a strong residence with Mātauranga Māori and Kaupapa Māori? Because up until the mid-70s, the theory that was prevailing in academic circles was a theory in which the base starting point was society was an egalitarian space. And therefore, if you came through social development programs not doing well, there was something wrong with you because the prevailing frame was society is fundamentally equal. So along comes critical theory mercifully as I'm hitting university and teachers college and the starting point of critical theory is that society is fundamentally unequal. And it is unequal at the structural level and it is created unequal. Point number one, few, <laughs> few, a whole lot of answers quickly fall into place. Point number two about critical theory is that it argues that social issues can be explored at three different levels, which is where you get the structural level three, the institutional level three, and the personal, interpersonal level. Few again, because one of the things that happened for me when I arrived as a junior lecturer at Massey 
was the Māori education courses that I inherited, and there were some, which was a blessing in itself, were written at a level which really, teacher education program, focused the students in the class at the interpersonal level. There was a lot of work on the attitude of the teacher. There was a lot of work on the emotional climate of the classroom. But if teacher education as a body of work was positioned ahistorically and a-theoretically and a-structurally, the teacher had nothing to do on Monday but try to make everybody feel good about themselves. And that's not enough. That is seriously not enough. So the first task for me as a young junior lecturer, mercifully I'd been through the class, and the person who was teaching it, Dr Douglas Bray, was an absolutely fabulous older Pākehā man at the end of his career who had trained as a psychologist, and I think he would agree saw another way and became more sociologically inclined. Um, and it was his courses that I was able to work with him to rewrite, to bring in the historical context, to bring in the structural analysis dimension that enabled the teacher to say, on Monday morning, this is what we're going to do, because you're still a teacher, but you are going to approach it in a particular way that enables you to understand your place as the self in a learning teaching environment and to work with children in a manner enhancing way. We didn't use the word manner enhancing in that day, um, but we did put a different frame on that course in a way that enabled us to approach teaching quite differently. I guess because I was a young uh, lecturer and because I was a junior lecturer and most of my students were about 30 years older than me and they were principals, they didn't take much notice of me all the time. But the interesting thing about power relations is I marked the assignments. <laughs> so I just waited. We went through the programs, we went through the courses, we did all of the exercise, and at the end of the day, if you did the research and did the work, then you got the grades. If you didn't, I made that judgment. Power really is corrupting sometimes. <laughs> So one of the things that happened along my journey as an academic as well is that I got to be in a situation where putting mātauranga Māori into the university was my core responsibility. Writing courses at Massey, writing courses at Vic, bringing the Māori dimension in because seriously in 1990, Sorry, 1988, I took up a role at Victoria University as the only Māori lecturer in the education department. 1988, 1990 celebrations were two years away. There were no courses in Māori education at undergraduate level or postgraduate level and no research programme in 1988. So we had a lot of work to do. And it was work about bringing the whole of understanding everything about who we are into that space. We were clear that the work around Fano, particularly and Mātauranga Māori in the policy space presents both challenges so as Len Cook would observe when we were writing the executive summary for what works with Fano and the Families Commission, with a bit of a quizzical look on his face, in the policy space, Fano is quite unique. It is both a target of public policy and it is a vehicle of public policy. And there aren't many concepts, as we talked at that time, that that is the case. So mātauranga Māori, Māori development, bringing our own knowledge into the work that we do, still a difficult ask in New Zealand in 2017, but an absolutely necessary ask if in answering the question what works with Māori, we are going to approach it in a way that even resembles the fullness and the beauty of everything that it is. So as well as the for example, far no notion in the public policy space that it is both target and vehicle. It's also about a, an interesting way to understand the changing way in which whānau gets to have a presence in the public policy space through policy science. So whānau order, at its essence, is policy science that the public policy world really is having a difficult time grappling with. But in the grappling with it, and Bill English speaks about this on regular occasions, this is groundbreaking not only in the history of the public service in New Zealand, but internationally as well. So, you know, when we think of how difficult it might be in the short term to get a whole of government approach, to get out of silos, to be able to take something like a concept from the Māori world and work it in an essentially Western, bureaucratic, non-Māori world, 
being able to do that is the nation building opportunity. You know, and if we take a Pacific image, every single pearl starts as a bit of grit. And the more the oyster tries to get the grit out, the more beautiful and the bigger the pearl at the end of that process. So if you're feeling that some of the things you're doing with Māori knowledge or Māori language or Māori people, I think we're a fabulous people to deal with. It would appear from some of my peer evaluations that that is not always the case. <laughs> Sometimes it seems Māori people in the public policy space want to go faster than the machine is designed to cope with. But at the end of the day, if we keep that image of the pearl in mind, each time you meet a little bit of grit or a little bit of wriggle needed to move it, then I hope you see the beauty in the nation building vision that the treaty gives us to be able to work with. Looking at this, we have the Crown Party in the frame, we have the Iwi Treaty Partner in the frame, and at each of those different six main boxes, from the top to the bottom, we have, working from left to right, machinery of iwi. Yep, machinery of iwi. There are also iwi that would describe themselves not as machinery of iwi, but after you heard the Whānau Order Commissioning presentation this morning from the iwi representative, you will be clear, machinery of iwi is now unnamed of part of the game. And that's a function of our post-settlement government entities. And it isn't always a machine which hears all of the voices of the people, but it is a new machine, so we'll give it time. Sometimes women have to, I was going to say scream, but women don't scream, do we? Women have to say things a little louder even to be heard in the machinery of iwi. And the partnership through the machinery of government at that structural level is our policy, our regulatory and our compliance space. So the interesting level below that at the institutional level is where some very, very original Māori development opportunity occurs, and that is through the marae at the institutional level with the Iwi Treaty Partner and through the agencies and the institutions. And one of the biggest areas of work in the Māori space that sits ahead of us all um, is how to create treaty-based organisations in Aotearoa such that we recognise we are in Aotearoa when we are working with our organisations. Um, the other is the role of Marae 744 in the Tupuni Kōkiri 2009 report on status of Marae and the fact, for example, that in a disaster Marae mobilised faster than anyone else. Christchurch earthquake, case in point, this Marae mobilised that night. Edgecombe, when the earthquake was in the Edgecombe area in the Bay of Plenty, Marae mobilised before the Red Cross. So why is it, New Zealand, that at a time of crisis, Marae are central and grounding and accepted and powerful, just like that? And when we need to do other things, Marae in New Zealand society are invisible, not always seen as really safe places to go and are actually under the radar of the public policy space. What changed that in a powerful way was the Waitangi Tribunal and the use of marae to hear evidence and to gather data. So it is a moving feast. But that space for marae there is a particularly Māori space. It's also a Pacific space. We have connections across the Pacific with it and it's an institution that we ought to own authentically as our own and use much more than we do. We miss opportunities in the public policy space by not exploring the marae. And then at the personal level, our ability on both sides of the treaty to be powerful citizens of Aotearoa, and of course, Mason in his 2001 address to the Hui Taumata uh, in Taupo talked about the three objectives that Māori generally agree on. To live as citizens of the world, to be well, and to also be wealthy in a sense that's not just about financial gain. That right to be able to live as Māori is why we name our mokopono rōpata te kauru te rangi u in East Hope and why I fill his head every time I see him with a 100% pure download of how utterly fabulous he is. 
And I tell you, God, help any teacher who tries to tell them any different because we will be in there as a whanau <laughs> as soon as we can, three generations of teachers, correcting anybody who tr tries to disrupt the leadership discourse that that boy already has in his mind. <laughs> One last thing that I'd like to end on as we bring together a little exploration of some things about Māori policy, some things about Māori knowledge. The Crown is yet to respond to Y262. And until that is the case, Mātauranga Māori in its richness and its depth and its breadth cannot inform, inform the public service because there is no mandate for that response to be a whole of government response yet. In a, at a time when State Services Commission 2016 Human Capability Survey has just advised that 16% of public servants are Māori, but not reaching the top one, two, three levels of management. Not in the senior management space, not in the policy analyst space, overrepresented in the lower levels of the public service. 11% pay rate gap between Māori and other staff. In the areas of who is paid most in the public service, there are eight groups listed. Māori men come third, they're ranked. Māori women come fifth. So we've got a lot of work to do. Firstly, to require the Crown to respond to Y262 so that Mātauranga Māori can have a whole of government response. And then to make sure that people in the public policy space we are working with understand what it means to work in a Mātauranga Māori space. And that's sometimes scary for us as a people too, because we're not living with a fixed body of knowledge. We're as excited about adapting our knowledge and creating new ways to be in the future as anyone else. And I want to acknowledge Lady Arohia Jury for a moment, because I'm not sure if she remembers, but in the early 1990s, I wrote a paper called Towards Theories of Māori Feminisms. I'm sorry about the title. It's the space I was in at the time. <laughs> and it was for a book called Feminist Voices that was edited by a group of really high-powered Pākehā feminists and moi. <laughs> Not in that space. Uh, and two-thirds of the paper was writing about the issue of Māori women speaking on the marae. And I knew about peer review, so I photocopied this paper and I sent it out to 30 <laughs> academics. Do you know that as I was posting it, I was standing at the letterbox crying because I knew that the analysis was not one that was going to find favour with everybody. <laughs> but I posted it anyway because that's what you do. <laughs> Arohia, bless her, and the role she has had for many Māori women as a leader and a champion and a pioneer for our people is the only academic who responded to that paper who wrote me a review, who gave me feedback, who pointed out some new areas of thought for me to go into. And so I acknowledge, we always acknowledge Tom Mason's role and it's absolutely fabulous, but I acknowledge your role too, Lady Arrow here, in all of the work that you have done in Māori education and Māori women's development. You know, people, we have Tariana here, we have Whaturangi here, we have Mason and Arrow here. Our company is ho called Hope Brokers because we may not always be stockbrokers, but I tell you what, we are definitely hope brokers as a people, and the future is ours. Come on a journey with us. Kia ora tātou.